Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here because the, this is my tent, Euro Python, and it, it's really stunning to be again with all of you, all the new friends together after two tough years. So today we will speak about self-explaining API. So. Um, I work for the Italian Digital Transformation Department, and today I will present you how to design schemas that simplify the API mashup and interoperability. At first, I will explain you the concept of controlled vocabularies, and then how to use them for creating interoperable REST API based on contract-first schema design. At the end, uh, I show how a central data catalog for semantic interoperability, well, a lot of words, will support this approach. But don't worry, uh, this is not a, a talk about semantic web theoretics. And well, for uh, semantic web folks, please forgive me. I will try to make things understandable. In Italy, we want to simplify API mashup, but it's not easy because we are a lot of people, uh, we have a lot of agencies, and every agency is publish their own data sets or services through API. So uh, the hard part is that all of these should have some common meaning, some com common ground, and this is not easy. Let's see how, um, uh, let's see a, a simple example. Well, uh, what's semantic? Semantic is the study of meaning. And this is important to be sure that a message is understood. Now we, we can see two different API messages. But uh, those are not very clear uh, because in the first case, we don't know if it is a full name or it is just a first name. And if it is a full name, which is the first one, and uh, which is the family name. In the second case, uh, we don't know, okay, we know he, uh, that Fabiano Romildo earns four million something, but we don't know what something is. So if we have to exchange this message with another country that has a different currency, this message can be problematic to integrate or to mesh up. The solution, are controlled vocabularies. Controlled vocabularies are a computer science tool that uses URI to disambiguate terms. It is very simple. So the, the first part of the URI is the name of the vocabulary. For example, this is DBpedia vocabulary. Then there is the term, in this case it's dog. And then there is a definition. Uh, you see the RDFS comment, it, it's the common uh, field name in vocabularies for a definition that is written in human readable language. So vocabularies contain a collection of terms and define concept and relationship in a specific domain. For example, in healthcare, in finance, whatever. They are validated by a designed uh, designated authority that is not necessarily a public authority. For example, your company, your own company, could have a vocabulary for defining the different job titles, for example, so that uh, when uh, the uh, hiring managers have to hire people, they can use a very well-specified um, job positions to do it, and they just not invent job position. And they are formally described, we have languages uh, for that, uh, using the text turtle media type or its JSON counterpart, the, the JSON LD, which is a W3C uh, specification. Actually, all those um, specifications, all those languages are completely uh, isomorphic, so you can switch from turtle to JSON LD uh, and uh, have exactly the same information. Complex vocabularies are called ontologies, but, well, this uh, is not the focus on. On, on, of this talk, and uh, code lists are the simplest form of vocabulary, they're simple list of terms. For example, the job title, title one uh, I was uh, saying to you. So let's see how to create a very simple uh, vocabulary. 
Uh, here we have a vocabulary made up of four terms described in Turtle. At first, I declare the URI namespaces so I can write it in a more concise way. Instead of writing uh, W3ID, uh, W3.org uh, 2000, and so on, I just like, write RDFS. Then I declare, uh, I define the terms using one or more sentences. A sentence is made by a triple, a subject, a predicate, and an object. So I say that uh, a person is a natural person. It is described, you see the RDFS uh, comment uh, predicate, means that this is for human. It's human readable, it's not machine readable. The person has a given name, uh, and the given name is the given name of a person. The same uh, for registered family. As you can see, uh, family is a complex term, and different countries, for different countries, or for different communities, family can mean uh, something different. But even in the same country, for different agencies, the term family could have different meanings. In this case, in this vocabulary, a registered family is a family, is a group of people tied together according to a very specific Italian law. For a, a service uh, produced by another uh, agency, the term family could have a different meaning. In this case, it is not a IT registered family. You can see that IT is W3ID.org, Italia onto CPV. This means that uh, worldwide, I can classify a registered family with a unique URI that is valid worldwide. If Italy is going to interpret with another country and we use that term, they can see the m meaning of that term. And another country or another agency can use a different URI to define a family. So, three terms for now. Now I define another term that is child of. This child of is the child parent relation, and you can see I have another uh, predicate. Uh, I, I have another sentence defining this child of that is uh, that it applies to person. In this case, I have a very clear definition of what uh, what is a person, what is a given name, what is a registered family, and what does this child of mean in a very small vocabulary. Every term is well defined in this file. So, um, I can use uh, Python to process this kind of files. The library is rdflib, and vocabularies are interpreted as graph, because I have entities that are related together. Subject and objects are related by predicate. So, I parse those files uh, in a graph, and then I can translate this information from the turtle format to the JSON-LD format that is completely isomorphic. I have even other uh, ways of serializing this information, for example, in XML, but we, don't, we are not interested in XML. In this case, you can see that I have a context. The context is that the IT string means that long URI, and then I have a graph that is made of a list of triples. I have the is child of that has a comment, and it has a domain. You can see that ID, the domain is, has an ID. This means that there is another um, line in the graph that contains ID, uh, IT person. Let's make another example. This is very interesting and very useful. Um, I can uh, use and define vocabularies not only for concept like the person concept, but even to define information, data set. Uh, this allows me to provide a lot of information in, in data set, and this information uh, doesn't need, uh, uh, don't need to be um, 
linear. They can be graphs. So in this case, uh, this is a vocabulary based on this cost and doubling core standards. Those standards allows, uh, provides keywords and predicates to create more and more uh, vocabularies. Syntax support internet, internationalization using language tag. For example, I can see the country uh, ITA. I, this is the subject. Ident, the identifier is the ITA string. I have two labels, but I can have more, one in Italian and one in France. The same concept can be uh, shortened, expressed in a more concise way. So sentences with the same subject and pre predicate can be shortened using uh, semicolon and comma. For example, I can just write the France as an identifier and two prefer preferred label. And they can even create terms. For example, for the Czech Republic, I can say that it replaced another entry that is in the vocabulary, that is Czechoslovakia. And it's the same for the Slovak Republic. And on the contrary, I can say that um, the Czechoslovakia has been replaced by Czech Republic and Slovak Republic. Uh, if you can see uh, all that stuff, uh, you can understand that vocabularies improves quality because in my service, if I say, okay, I use a tree code, a tree uh, ISO code uh, letter to identify a country, and if I say that I'm using this EU vocabulary, I have not only with those three letters the information of which country it is, but I have the localization of this country name in all the language of the European Union, and they have even a lot of more information. For example, whether this country uh, has a euro uh, uh, currency, if this country has been replaced by another, for example. This is very important uh, for um, registry information because if you're a um, citizen from the Czech Republic and you were born before, uh, for example, in 1980, you were not born in Czech Republic you were born in Czechoslovakia. So you can use this table, to uh, the, this vocabulary, to map back the uh, old information about countries. And all you need to store on your data set is the three-letter code. So uh, we can see that this is very helpful. Uh, vocabularies are stored in graph databases. So you can use Virtuoso, you can use Amazon Neptune, and you can query those databases with all this information using the Sparkle protocol. In this case, I have the vocabulary we have seen before. I make a query, and in this query where I specify a list of predicates that should match, in this case I say the URI should be in the scheme of the Eurovoc country vocabulary, Eurovoc and SCOS are uh, resolved using the namespace I introduced before. They should uh, have a concept uh, using the pref label, and they have an identifier. I am interested in the concept uh, localized in English and, and not in the others. And in this case, I just extract a sim very simple table with the URI, the concept, so Italy, uh, France, and the identifier. So I can populate this information into a graph database and extract very simple views of those complex information. So uh, I explained what our uh, vocabularies are. Now we'll see how can we use them in, in a very simple uh, way. So I can use vocabularies to describe data. This is a very simple example. It's not a country, that's me. Uh, that is identified by an email URI, so you can see this is my mail, it's me worldwide, that's me. Uh, this is defined by four sentences. The, the first one, uh, well, they are actually five, I updated my slides, but the first sentence says that I am a person according to the Italian vocabulary for person. I have other predicates that says which are my given name according to the Italian vocabulary, my family name 
according to Italian vocabulary. Okay, it seems, uh, it seems simple because it's a family name, but uh, our friends from Iceland, for example, they have a patronymic or matronymic. So the concept of family name uh, in Iceland is different from the one we have in other uh, European countries. Or for example, this is my given name, but was it the same name I have I had when I was born is, is the same name that I had on, on my birth certificate, or maybe I changed my name in time. So uh, as you can see, when you design services for millions of people, there are a lot of other uh, cases that may happen and you, uh, that you may have to take into account. So in this case, uh, I am stating that this is my given name that I have now, not the one I had at birth. This is my family name and not my patronymic or my matronymic. Uh, this is my birthplace, and that's according to the EU vocabulary. Uh, and I have an ident identifier that, okay, I picked my mail, but it can even be different from the one I used in my a subject uh, predicate. Application can use all this information back here and all that linked information to automate interoperability checks and other logics. For example, they may check if I, the country where I was born is existing now or if maybe it's changed, for example. So it has been superseded by other countries. So those are all checks that you can do if you use data that is linked through vocabularies. Well, the nice thing about linked data is that they have many dimensions, they are graphs. And there is people that spend their lives populating this, this information, but actually you can project them to lower dimensions so that people that is not aware of all those complexity can use them because people maybe is just interested in a list of country names and the localized names so that when uh, it pops up um, window on a web application, uh, you can see uh, Italy instead of Italia, for example. So there are specification that allows you to project data on those dimension. That is the JSON-LD framing to project this kind of data into very simple JSON object that is Sparkle that uh, you can use to make queries and produce, for example, CSV. There is the CSV for the web. There is another specification that allows to interpret CSV information as linked data. So the important thing is to build stuff using specification. Let's see JSON LD framing. This is uh, using the Python uh, PyLD vocabulary. So. This code is um, quite simple. Loads the European country vocabulary from that URL that is published by the European Commission. Then uh, loads into a JSON object, and then it makes a projection. A project, uh, to make a projection uh, is named framing in, in the specification. So uh, it selects all the subject that has a given type, for example, uh, all um, subject that has a, that have a type cost concept. This is a technical, but that, that's okay. It um, uses and shows all the fields that I am seeing there. So country code, version info, and label in English. But those fields do not exist yet. This is the shape I, the, the shape I want to uh, the JSON object to have, but we will see it in the next slide. And then I have a context. The context take the um, RDF information on the right, so the ID, the DC identifier, the version info, the prefer preferred label localized in, in English, and map it to the, specific, to the specific fields. And the next thing is that the, the context um, object you can see there, can be used to convert back the simplified JSON object to the original semantic stuff. But let's see, because it's very simple. On the left, I have the vocabulary. On the right, I have the JSON. So 
In the context, I say URL uh, is an ID, so it takes the ID from the, uh, uh, the subject of the vocabulary and puts it into the URL field. Then it takes this cost pref label predicate, just takes the IT localization and puts it in label underscore IT. It takes the version info and puts it into the version info object. Since I'm not specifying anything about the euro currency currency adoption date, it just keeps this information. In this way, I have a very simple projection of those very complex information that can be provided to web developers that have no knowledge of all the complexity of vocabularies we are exp explaining now, but that can use it, for example, to populate uh, web forms or APIs. So uh, the challenge when we work with vocabularies is making this information accessible. But we can build platforms so that we can publish data in different formats and uh, so that people can use them directly to create APIs or for online fillable forms. So I have this linked data information with an intertal. It's complex, maybe boring, maybe not comprehensible. OK, but I can create a platform where, through framing that I showed before, I produce a JSON API. Or I can produce CSV, so you just get, you pick the fields you want to, to see, and you get a tabular data. Or I can produce a JSON schema. Imagine I want to uh, produce an API, and uh, I want to populate a field, OK? A field should be constrained by only the countries that are in this vocabulary. OK, this is a JSON schema. You can see it. That provides an enumeration of all the fields that are contained in that vocabulary. So people. Uh, is not supposed to understand how the vocabulary works, but you can write an API that wraps it and provide it as a JSON schema so that people that, building the, that is going to build an API can say, okay, just reference this uh, JSON schema URL and you will get that vocabulary for free. Uh, another thing you can embed it is in, into frictionless data that is a specification that provides metadata to, um, for tabular data. So the, the part, the, the, we are mostly working on uh, enabling people to use in a simple way this data that is, can seem complex, that seems not completely understandable. So uh, this shift now, semantic uh, APIs, when we have APIs, we want that APIs can reference concepts and vocabularies to provide a complete and machine-readable description of the exchange concept. So if I send a payload, I want that a machine can be able to validate it, not only for, for its syntax, but even for this semantic. So how can you build semantic APIs? Semantic APIs should be built using the same vocabularies. When different APIs use the same vocabularies, uh, there is this feature that we have seen before that is the JSON-LD context that allows to map JSON properties to vocabulary terms. In this case, we have two API payloads. The, one, the first one is in Italian, the second one is in English. How can I know that they map to the same person, for example. I can write for my API a context. That is the, this text in red. This context says that the nome proprio fields maps to the Italian vocabulary, uh, w3id.org, uh, Italia given name, that cittadinanza maps to the has citizen concept. And uh, in the concept, I say that it uses the European country vocabulary. This means that whatever you have in the, in the value, so the 
ITA string should be appended to the base of the context. Well, if the other APIs makes the same work with the given name, citizenship, and so on, they can be mapped back to the same vocabulary. So you can see that uh, I can transform back and see that the user has an IT given name, Mario, and then as an IT as citizenship that has the fu full URI of Italy in the European country vocabulary. So the, the, the work that should be done is to design APIs that should interoperate between different, for example, ecosystem. Uh, together, for example, imagine you have to integrate uh, uh, an API that works on the finance sector uh, with another API that works in, in the registry sector or in another financial sector where there are some regulations that are different. You should uh, gather your payloads and check to understand whether the concept that you are using in your APIs are the same. Because, for example, uh, in, in some cases, you may use uh, the concept of a legal person. And in other contexts, you can use the concept of physical person. They may not map in different ecosystems, and this means that uh, maybe in some cases, if you are using a, a, or are creating a financial application that only works with people, it, it's OK. But if you are creating a financial application that works, or that should work both for physical person and legal person for, with companies, maybe you need to tweak your application before integrating, before meshing up. Otherwise, uh, you may end uh, with um, inconsistency. Uh, so how can this enable um, interoperability in uh, cross-border services? Well, the, the basic game is that the European Commission defined a basic vocabulary for a person to identify a subset of person, so that um, on the left, you have a registry name uh, in Italy with a given name. There is a second name, uh, a surname, uh, and a country. I can see that some of those fields map to the European vocabulary, that is w3.org slash ns slash person. So in, I can map some of these fields, some of uh, the, the second name that maps to uh, alternate name has no mapping. But for this subset, I can transform this uh, person record to a person record that, uh, should be, uh, that is possible to map in all other uh, European countries. And the same can, uh, uh, can be done by other countries. This means that I have a basis to create interoperable service so that if you move to Finland, for example, or to Ireland, uh, the basic uh, uh, registry information are available all across Europe. So uh, the problem now is that we have three different specifications. The first specification is the linked data tart of stuff, JSON-LD, that is uh, used by um, semantic scientists or by the semantic web specialists. And that is very complex to be understood uh, for web developers, service developers, and so on. And the other world that is related to web developers, API developers, is the open API world. The problem is, how can I bridge those two worlds, which have different uh, requirements? When I design 
a service that should be available for 60 million people, for example, I have to shape for uh, billions of requests. So I cannot convey every time all the semantic information that I need to describe all the specificity, all the specificity of a service. So I cannot convey the complete payload, uh, semantic payload. And in, in the other case, if I have to convey this payload to another country to create an interoperable service because I want to um, attend um, France University while my uh, records are uh, in reading in using Italian schemas, how can the French university web service understand those kind of schema? We try to bridge the gap. So we leave agencies the freedom to define their own JSON schema. So they can define freely the fields they want in providing their services. But they, uh, they should do it in a way that fields map consistently. The meaning of the fields should be consistent with the Italian ontology, so with the Italian vocabularies. So when you say, for example, given name, it's not the patronymic, it's not the matronymic, it's not the, the name you had at birth, but it's the name, the name that you have now and after you change your name because you don't like your old name or because um, you don't like your surname and you change. This is the name you have currently on the Italian National Registry. And the country should provide, the, the agency that provides the service should provide semantic information in the form of a JSON-LD context. The JSON-LD context is this thing we uh, saw before. So it's a, it's a or it's an object where every JSON field is mapped back to an URI in a vocabulary. So the country should be mappable, the given name should be mappable, the surname should be mappable. If I have this kind of information into the schema, I can design the integration before start developing. So it's an exchange of information that does not happen at runtime, not while the agencies or while the mashup is ongoing, but when two organizations design the API, they will check the context, they will check whether the semantic of those API is the same, and then they will be able to um, create a mashup that is syntactically coherent and that can be used at the integration phase because you can write tests that, for example, if you rely on vocabulary, that download during the test the vocabulary and check whether the information you have provided in your test are coherent, for example, with the uh, job title that your organization decided for with the list of countries that your organization uh, uh, intended, or for example, whether the web developers of your UI use the same localization labels that are provided by the vocabulary. So uh, for this one, we um, filed a draft RFC that you're welcome to, um, to check. And we even stubbed some uh, uh, interfaces, for example, we implemented a very simple uh, modified Swagger editor where while you design your API, if you use, if you stub it, the URL of the uh, person class, for example, it will make a query on that endpoint, on the Sparkle endpoint that stores that uh, information, that vocabulary, and provides you with all the properties that are stored into uh, the graph database. In this case, the web developer doesn't need to know uh, about vocabularies. He just needs to know that there is a model class for person and that 
it can use that model, it can use the properties uh, in different ways, in different order, in uh, different shapes, but it needs to map that each property that he provides in his own schema to the original properties that are in, in the class. And in some cases, for example, uh, if there are vocabularies for those specific properties, you can use and import those properties either in the form of uh, lists or either in the form of open API uh, schemas. So all these happen at design time, and um, catalogs ensure that API design is consistent within a given ecosystem. So in Italy, we are building this national data catalog for semantic interoperability. It's a long name, but well, that's it. We already have a set of controlled vocabularies that you can uh, get from the uh, URI. The sources are on GitHub, and those vocabularies are aligned with the European authority tables. Authority tables are very uh, interesting if you have to plan um, services that have thousands of uh, uh, producers and consumers that work independently. Because in this way, you don't need that people to sync up between themselves, but they can always rely on those authority tables. And the National Data Catalog for Semantic Interoperability uh, will allow to find reusable, uh, reusable vocabularies and ontology, share semantically interoperable schemas and public services, and ensure that APIs have a correct meaning and can be meshed up together. Then we are working on a lot of semantic uh, specification for interoperability. We are registering the YAML uh, media type because it has not been formalized, formalized yet. And in this work, we are providing security and interoperability consideration. It's very interesting. I suggest you to, to, to read it. There is uh, a YAML LD. Uh, that is a W3C specific, ongoing specification that allows to express all this uh, information instead of using JSON in YAML. And then there is this specification to bridge JSON schema uh, and uh, open, I, open API so that uh, you can uh, formalize better all those concepts. Uh, even there, you can see interoperability and security uh, consideration. If you are into this kind of stuff, please uh, drop me a line. Uh, there is a lot of uh, community work that is ongoing, both with the Open API community, in the ITF, in the W3C, and we are uh, working on all those tables together. Then there is this very experimental work we are doing, that is to bridge REST APIs and linking data. This uh, work is ongoing on, uh, on GitHub. And then uh, we are even trying to bridge those kind of stuff uh, with frictionless data. That is a, this specification that allows to uh, bridge um, CSV and uh, Excel and data that is exported in not very semantic stuff to um, well uh, comprehensible, well understandable uh, Rust um, API uh, ecosystem. Well, I think that um, I'm done. I have some, uh, I finished quite early. Uh, we have some time, if we have some time, we can, uh, I can show you a couple of demos, but at first uh, I, I think better quite, to have some questions. So if anybody have any questions, uh, please come to the mic, and we'll have some Q&A session. And in the meantime, if you want to show some demo, maybe you could show some demo. Um, well, okay, I can show you a couple of specifications. Oh, okay, question first. Okay, uh, so you've mentioned that you've designed a whole system for around like 60 million users. So I guess that that's not the real number of the users how, which, are, which are connecting with your, with your system. So what's the real workload and how, how it is, how, 
what is the, the, the demand in comparison to, to what you've designed system for? Well, actually, we design system for 60 million users because... Uh, there are 60 million Italians, right? Yes, and, and we provide services to all of them. And actually, the kind of designing system is even wider because, for example, uh, 60 million is just users, but we have 10 million companies, we have vague vehicles. So the, the goal of our work is not just to design the single systems, but since every agency, for example, the Ministry of the Interior designed the system for the National Registry population, okay? The problem is that you have to make all this information interoperable and integrable with all the other agencies that, for example, have information for vehicles or for companies. Or, for example, the, for the invoicing system that process every single invoice that is um, uh, issued in Italy. So, uh, when an invoice is processed, you need to ensure that the, um, the sender and the recipient are existing living person, for example. So, actually, the, in terms of workload, uh, we are speaking of system of thousands of APIs that are interconnected. And, and the challenge is not really operational, because if you just want to uh, face this kind of things operational, you can say, OK, there are some best practice in addressing single services. But the point is that if every agency design this system in isolation, when you have to create services for citizens that needs to integrate the API of the population registry with the API for companies and the API for uh, the um, fiscal information, for example, uh, if those kind of services are not harmonized because every single agency uh, design this kind of services, optimizing for their specific workload, then you will have very efficient services, vertical services, but you're not allowing an API ecosystem to grow and you are not allowing, for example, local agencies to build services. One of the problems you have, for example, is that in, in Italy you have, let's say, 400 central agencies that are big, but you have 8,000 municipalities. And they are very close to the city then. And they have no, uh, uh, not every uh, municipality, has great money for expenditure in creating large services, but they may uh, be able to mesh up uh, at least basic services to provide customized user experience for their citizens, for example, for uh, some social uh, services. So the, the challenge is, is quite different. It's not just workload. It's, that it is to optimize the workload of the country, not just the, the workload of a single of a single agency, because for a single agency, it, 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 in general, it's complex. Yes, because it's complex, really complex, but it's doable because you say, okay, this is this is for a country. I mean, <laughs> that's a huge scale. Yeah, uh, the, the problem is to create something that can uh, serve not only the verticals but even the locals. A region should be able to mesh up uh, APIs that are provided by uh, great uh, major uh, ministries or um, global agencies, uh, or well, national wide agencies. So the challenge is this one. Uh, I don't know if, I, I understand I have not answered to your question, but uh, I think that- Yeah, but you've, dis you've described the matter of the issue. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Roberto, for the talk. And let's give him a round of applause. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So our next session will be after.